Funding for Building New York is provided by First American Title Insurance Company of New York. Welcome to Building New York. My name is Michael Stoller. Everybody wants to own real estate in New York. And last year, Bob Knackle's company, Massey Knackle, sold 579 properties, building sites and a variety of properties, for a so, some total of $1.75 billion. Imagine that amount of money sold on properties in the city of New York. Today, I'm lucky to have the chairman and co-founding partner of Massey Knackle Realty, Bob Knackle. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here today. How does a guy who grows up in Maywood, New Jersey, who plays baseball uh, in Maywood, goes to the Wharton School of Business, decide to get involved with real estate? Well, it was completely by accident, and I, I feel very fortunate because real estate for most people is a career that is a second, third, or a fourth career. Uh, and I was very lucky because at the, uh, at the Wharton School in 1980, during my freshman year, uh, I wanted to be an investment banker just like every other student at Wh Wharton so, wanted to So you to wanted be. to be Gordon Gecko, Michael to, Milken, and want, you really felt this was this is where you were going to be. Exactly. Wanted to Forget be the next crappy Gordon real Gecko. estate. That was the market. Right. So I thought that to uh, help my investment banking career, it would be nice to uh, have a summer job that would look good on my resume. So during spring break my freshman year, I went around northern New Jersey, which is where Maywood is, uh, dropping my resume off at every commercial bank and investment bank that I saw. And I was in Hackensack, and I came out of a Payne Weber office, and across the hall I saw Coldwell Banker. And I said to myself, great, another bank. Let me go and drop my resume off, which I did. Uh, later that day, I received a call from someone at Coldwell saying that they'd like to interview me for a summer job the following day. Uh, and so, uh, being prudent, I went to the library the, the day before the interview. There, were, there wasn't yeah. the internet, so you couldn't check it right. out Could, at that time. couldn't check the internet. I had to go to the library to look up Coldwell Banker to see how big this bank was. And when I discovered that it was a real estate company, I almost didn't go on the interview. And probably if you realized that it was a real estate company that was owned by Sears, you would have said, what am I selling uh, tools and Sears? <laughs> exactly. So what happens? You, you, you take a job at Coldwell Banker? Yeah, well, they were actually the only ones that uh, had offered an interview for a summer position. So I went on the interview. Uh, I took the job. And literally from my first day on the job, I loved it. Uh, it was a, a very energetic environment, uh, a lot of young people working very so what hard. what is an 18-year-old uh, or 19-year-old kid doing at Coldwell Banker during the summer? Well, in my first summer, I was doing market research, which entailed uh, essentially driving around Morris County uh, and writing down information on every office building that I saw. And I literally took a Hagstrom map and drove up and down every street and created a log of every commercial property that I encountered. And there was a whole team of people that were doing this in what Coldwell called their data bank program. Uh, and I would uh, report in the results every day and uh, went back my next summer actually to run that uh, summer internship program for Coldwell. And then during my third summer, I actually was a an assistant to a senior broker, and I was driving around Morris County showing industrial buildings to uh, to tenants and potential buyers. So you, so you want to be this investment banker? You spent three years or three summers right now. It's the f you graduate from Wharton, and then what do you do? Do you want to go back to Maywood, New Jersey, or Hackensack, or do you want to come to the Big Apple? Well, I wanted a bigger challenge, so I don't know what it was specifically that prompted me to want to come work in Manhattan. 
Uh, but I thought it would be exciting and knew that I wanted to come to Manhattan to sell buildings and uh, interviewed with the uh, the manager of the Manhattan office for Coldwell Banker uh, during that third summer and was offered a position in Manhattan upon graduation. So you, you come to Manhattan and Coldwell Banker and as you were telling me prior to the show, you were you probably you and another young guy were the two youngest guys in the investment sales business. Exactly in our division, Coldwell at the time was the largest commercial broker uh, in the United States, uh, and in our Manhattan office there were about fifty brokers leasing office space, and there were four people at the time who were there that were selling buildings, and uh, that consisted of Paul Massey, who was also just a year out of school. Uh, and uh, three brokers that were very senior that had about 20, 25 years of experience. And of course the senior brokers didn't really want to interact with us that much being that we were right out of school. Uh, so from the second day on the job, Paul and I decided that we would work together, uh, become partners, which is, is really an amazing thing to think that for 22 years I've worked with Paul for uh, 12 hours a day, six days a week, and I've never had a fight or an argument with them. So it's really been a very, uh, uh, very fortunate partnership for me. And when did you and Paul decide uh, and and look at the organization that you've done? You're you're rated number one by CoStar in the sales of smaller properties in the city of New York. Um, when did you decide that uh, it was time to uh, go out on your own? Well, we, I, I've always been very entrepreneurial by nature. Um, and after a couple of years uh, of successful brokering, Paul and I had thought about the idea of potentially starting our own business. But we really liked Colo Banker a lot. And Colo Banker is now C.B. Richard Ellis, of course. Uh, but we liked the people there very, very much. So rather than leave, what we did is we made a proposal to senior management to make our division a separate profit center within the company. So at the age of 24, and Paul was what, a year older than you? 26. 26. The two of you, the hot shots over here, go to Coldwell Banker, which is still owned by Sears at that time, mm -hmm. and you say, I want to go out there and we want to run our own division. What happened? Well, uh, we put a business plan together and we didn't get any response. Uh, we submitted the business plan to our immediate boss, our regional manager, uh, and the president of the company. And in retrospect, I can understand why they wouldn't make a special deal for two young kids who only had a couple of years in. Um, but um, you know, we didn't get any response and we thought we would start our own company. Uh, we went to Chemical Bank thinking that we had a good track record and the bank would lend us the half a million dollars that we needed to start the business. And of course, when we spoke to the bankers, they laughed at us saying, well, come back to us after your business has been operating for three years and maybe we'll give you a couple of bucks. And you know what the interesting situation is, Massey Nackel has been in business all these years and Chemical Bank is no longer in business. <laughs> That's true. That's but true. you were telling me how, you know, you're the chairman of Massey Nackel, and why wasn't the K before the M? Well, Paul and I had a, a big argument, not an argument, but a big discussion about that. Clearly, uh, we each had self-interest to have our names first. Uh, so what we did is we uh, went out for a, a cocktail and went to the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria, and we actually flipped quarters on the floor of the Waldorf to determine which name would be first. And we flipped three quarters, uh, and it was best four out of seven. Paul was heads, I was tails. The first flip came up tails, and the next four in a row, Paul won. So uh, the name of the company became Massey Knackle, and fortuitously so, because Knackle is such a difficult name to spell that it's easier to have Massey first. That's, that's November 15th, 1988. Correct. And you, you find an office in one, a sublet with shag carpet somewhere. Yep, we were in about 800 square feet at 12 East 52nd Street with a pink shag carpet. And our entire office furniture setup cost us about $1,000, which we had, uh, I guess it was third or fourth hand furniture at that time, but that was our, our start. What happens in 1989? Well, 1989, the, uh, uh, the market started to turn. And after uh, a good year, year and a half, 
uh, the market started to soften. So in and 89, I think you said you sold six buildings? Uh, something like that. And 1990? 1990, we sold three buildings. And 1991? Uh, probably two or three again. How were, were you able to, I mean, this was a difficult time for the real estate world. And you have two young guys who have really, your, your income is predicated on what you sell and what you can do. How, how were you able to uh, finance your business during this period of time? Well, we were uh, very industrious and actually went around to every bank in town getting credit card applications. And fortunately, we both had very good credit, but we were able to uh, get uh, credit lines up to about $60,000 on personal credit and had to draw against those lines completely to pay the rent and keep the lights on and pay our secretary and that kind of thing. So we, uh, we were in debt quite substantially for the first time in 1990. And we were able to dig ourselves out of that hole uh, with a couple of transactions. Uh, and then about a year later, uh, the same thing happened, and we ran those lines up again, and still were unable to pay the bills. So uh, very fortunately, uh, a gentleman named Jack Holler uh, was nice enough to lend us uh, uh, $75,000, which we needed to keep the business going. And we had actually gone to a client of ours uh, who we knew was very, very wealthy, a gentleman with a, a nine-figure net worth, and asked him for 75000 to keep the doors open. And he was nice enough to offer us the 75000 provided we gave him 50% of the stock of our business. Uh, we didn't think That's that what was... happens when you're in the real estate business. <laughs> you have to take collateral. That's right. Uh, we didn't think that was such a good idea, so we actually uh, offered uh, Jack 25% uh, of the stock in our business for the $75,000 loan. Uh, and he was very, very uh, nice to us. And he said, guys, I'm going to give you the $75,000. Uh, but I don't want the stock in your business because there's going to be a day when you're going to be very successful and you're going to regret that you gave me the stock. And in his honor, our salesperson of the year award uh, in our Queen's office is named after Jack. And uh, I'll always be uh, very indebted to him for, for bailing us out at that time. Now, you told me that 1992 was really uh, something happened. There was a change. There was a building that was owned by a finance company in foreclosure, and you, you did something with it. Tell my audience a little bit about that. Well, that was a transaction that I'll never forget. Uh, it was three buildings on East 50th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, and they had been foreclosed on, which there were a number of foreclosures going on at that time. Uh, they were foreclosed on by Rosenthal and Rosenthal, um, and Mr. Rosenthal had retained us to market and sell those three buildings. Um, we signed a contract to sell them, and at the time, uh, the price was approximately $3 million, and those properties uh, are probably worth uh, 40 or $50 million today. Uh, but it was a $3 million transaction that was supposed to close in about 120 days. And about 30 days after the contract was signed, uh, we had already taken the loan from Mr. Holler, uh, we had spent most of that money on, on bills that we had, and we were kind of trying to figure out how we were going to make it through the next 90 days, and I returned to the office and I got a call from Stephen Rosenthal, and Mr. Rosenthal's son, saying, Bob, where are you? And I said, what are you talking about? I'm in my office. He says, well, get over here. I have a check for you. We closed the transaction today. The buyer decided to close early, and I have your commission check. Well, Michael, I got up from my desk, threw my coat on, and I was running down 54th Street, which is uh, where our office was at that time. And Paul happened to be getting out of a cab. And I saw him on the corner of 54th and 3rd, and I said, Paul, Paul, you won't believe it. Uh, the 50th Street transaction closed, and the check is waiting over at uh, Mr. Rosenthal's office. And we both started jumping up and down, hugging each other. And that was the transaction that got us out of our debt. Uh, we were able to pay off uh, the amounts that we had owed. And uh, from that point on, we started to get a lot of foreclosure resale work. Uh, and then in 1993, when the bank's REO departments were really disposing of a lot of foreclosed property, that's when the, the firm really started to take off. Now, for my audience, do you remember how much the buildings were sold for at that time? 
was approximately $3 million for those three buildings. And so now we're 14 years later. How much would those, pro those properties be worth today? Oh, probably 40 or $50 million. So it was not a bad investment for whoever it is. Not a bad but it's investment. interesting because I think what I was saying to you when we met is that you've shaped a lot of Manhattan because you've been involved with certain assemblages that have taken place. Uh, two blocks away from uh, this site, the initial site that really changed your life, you did a site called the Milan. Um, tell my audience a little bit about that. That's on the corner of 55th Street and 2nd Avenue. I think that's an interesting story of how the city changes. Correct. And, uh, land assemblage is something that's very, very tricky in New York. Um, the zoning laws tell you a couple of different things about properties. They tell you what the property can be used for. Uh, it tells you how much property, can, how much building can be on a particular site, uh, and tells you what shape the building can have. And often there aren't big vacant lots for development, so developers have to take their time, uh, sometimes over years, to acquire properties one at a time and put an entire site together. Um, we were retained uh, in 1994 to sell the old Club El Morocco site, which... The famed El Morocco, uh, which, which was on the corner of 54th and 2nd. Correct. Actually, uh, eld around the corner with frontage on 2nd and on 54th Street. Um, we were retained to sell that property, and there were some very interesting assemblage opportunities there. And what started out as a $3 million sale of one property uh, resulted in a nine-year project that involved 11 properties uh, with tenant buyouts, air right acquisitions, um, and resulted in what is the Millennium, a, uh, a the top quality condominium Milan, building in Milan. Milan. Right. And, and then a pr about a block away, to talk about another assemblage, you did an assemblage for uh, the MacLau properties. Correct. That's on the southeast corner of 53rd Street and 2nd Avenue. That's another assemblage that consisted of, I think it was five or six buildings, uh, and took us about four and a half, five years to complete. And recently, uh, you did another interesting assemblage, because 6th Avenue has really changed. When the, the, when the zoning was changed a couple of years from the flower zone, there were never residential apartment buildings. But recently, there's been something, and you just as late as two weeks ago, you did another assemblage on 6th Avenue. Right. We uh, sold the entire westerly block front on 6th Avenue between 30th and 31st Streets, uh, which was another very interesting transaction uh, because it started out as just the sale of the one commercial building at the southwest corner of 31st and 6th. Uh, we were able to convince the adjacent landlord, which was the Bernstein family that had owned uh, their property for about 60 years, uh, to include the air rights from their properties on the balance of the block and one parking lot that they had to the west of the property that we were selling. Um, and that marketing process led to a, uh, a price for, for that component part of the site uh, that was intriguing enough that the Bernstein family said, well, if, we can, if we're getting that much for this small portion of our air if rights... If the price lot, is right, we might as well sell. Right. So what ended up, uh, what, what started out as a uh, $25 million transaction uh, ended up as a $117.5 million transaction. So somebody where bought a block front or a half a block front. An entire block front. Uh, an entire block front for $117 million, right. or basically $350 a developable foot? Approximately about $352 a foot, correct. Since Massey-Nackle has been in business, how, much, how many buildings do you think you've sold and how many assemblages? I mean, if, if this year you did $1.7 billion and 579 properties, how many would you say? Well, I think as the entire history of the company, you know, over 17 and a half years or so, uh, we're probably narrowing in on about 3,000 properties sold. Uh, it's really been these numbers of 579 buildings and the year before, I think it was 400 and something. These, these are very, very large. We've had tremendous growth in the last few years. Uh, but in the early years, like we mentioned, in the early 90s, it was just a handful. So I think we're closing in on about, uh, about 3,000 properties sold, and that's probably somewhere in the $6 billion range. You know, a lot of people who are 
in your investment sales business always have that desire to own real estate and you only represent sellers uh, buyers love you because they know you have good deals but why haven't you or Paul uh, ever been a, a purchaser an owner of property well we think it's a conflict of interest for a broker to be purchasing properties also uh, especially as a seller representative let's assume that I'm retained to sell a property and I know that you're a buyer and you know that I'm a broker as well as an investor uh, if I said to you, Michael, I have a wonderful building for you to look at on uh, Madison Avenue and 38th Street, uh, the first question you're going to ask me is, Bob, if it's such a good property, why didn't you buy it? So we think that there's an inherent conflict of interest in being a buyer and a broker. Uh, so we've stayed away from that and try to remain very, very specialized in what we do, and that is only representing sellers, only representing them on an exclusive basis, and focusing all of our energy towards obtaining the highest possible price for the clients that have retained us. Prior to the show, we were talking that you said 19, you said 9-11 changed your business. What happened after 9-11, the tragic events of 9-11? Yes, well, subsequent to 9-11, a number of real estate companies were letting people go. Um, there was an anticipation that uh, leasing volume would slow down, that sales volume would slow down. Uh, and Paul and I have a very um, optimistic outlook of New York and New York's future. And we were very contrarian in our thinking and went on a large expansion at that time. We hired somebody to uh, run our human resources department and started aggressively uh, expanding and hiring people. Um, and the quality of the people that we saw that were available was tremendous, unlike anything we had ever seen. There were a number of MBAs that were looking to get into real estate in, in sales positions and a number of very, very highly qualified people from other fields because not only were real estate companies downsizing, many different industries were experiencing downsizing. So we found the pool of potential candidates to come to our firm was extremely well qualified. And now, it was originally the two of you and a secretary. Today, what, how many people do you have? Uh, we have 185 people. Uh, in three offices. We currently have offices in Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. Uh, we're currently looking for space in the Bronx because we have a dozen brokers that work out of our Manhattan office that cover the Bronx, but we like to be in the markets that we're serving. Uh, we also have a, a division that covers Staten Island out of our Brooklyn office, uh, and we're very, very bullish on the future of the city. Speaking of bullish on the city, the future of the city, you're involved, I believe, right now in a sale or an assembly of a property in Coney Island. Am I correct? Correct. What do you see happening in Coney Island? Well, the, the change in Coney Island has been dramatic. Uh, it was an area that was overlooked for quite a long period of time. Uh, it has a very, very rich history, uh, and it was, it was at one time a hub of commercial activity in that area. Uh, and we think that Coney Island is going to regain that prominence. And so there has been a lot of development activity, uh, a lot of uh, both speculation in terms of what's going to happen and tangible plans that are in process. Uh, and we think the future of Coney Island is very bright. You've also been on the forefront of uh, Harlem, the resurgence of Harlem. Um, many people always ask me, where do I see Harlem? And I'm, I'm a true advocate of uh, Harlem. What do you feel about Harlem and the Bronx? I think those are two areas that may have major growth. Yeah, two very fascinating areas, actually. Uh, we've seen uh, a resurgence in Harlem that goes way beyond new development on 125th Street. Uh, most people talk about that, but what they don't really talk about so much is the fact that there are condominium projects being developed all over Harlem. Uh, that vacant land has tripled in value in the past two years, uh, that there are a lot of people uh, moving into Harlem from both uh, outside of New York City as well as other boroughs, people from Queens and Brooklyn wanting to move into Manhattan, and so they've, uh, they've moved into Harlem because it's more affordable than uh, Manhattan south of 96th Street. Um, and so the future is very, very bright. 
for Harlem. Uh, with respect to the Bronx, we believe that the Bronx is the borough of the future. Uh, if you look at the Bronx relative to uh, its location, uh, its juxtaposition to uh, Westchester, to New Jersey, to uh, the other boroughs, uh, it has tremendous infrastructure. Uh, it has relatively affordable values, uh, and we believe that uh, city planning uh, has and will continue to create incentives for zoning changes, for development. Uh, and city planning has done a wonderful job of creating the incentive to develop areas that have tremendous potential for development. Um, and w we believe that in 20 years, if you take the circle line around Manhattan, you're going to go past the South Bronx and there'll be high-rise residential buildings there and condominiums with tremendous views of New York City. Uh, and we think that the, the potential is tremendous in the Bronx. You're 43 years of age. You're going to be around in 20 years. Where do you see uh, your company? And another question, would you want your son or daughter to be involved in the real estate business. Okay, well, I, I don't have any children. I, I hope to at some point, but if I did, uh, I don't think I'd want them to work at Massey Knackle. Uh, I wouldn't mind if they got into the real estate business. I think it's a fascinating business uh, with tremendous opportunity, but I think it's important for children to kind of make their own way in the world. Um, and uh, with respect to uh, where I see Massey Knackle in 20 years, uh, I know that Paul and I uh, love running the business. Uh, we love selling buildings and probably will still be in that capacity in one form or another. And uh, we'd like the company to continue to, uh, to grow and expand and create opportunities for people to come in, uh, maximize their potential, and uh, do a good job. So I'd say that with what you and Paul and your people are doing is that you've been shaping the, the changing face of New York City, and you've really been building New York. And I'd like to thank you for uh, being with me today and hope to see you again. Well, Michael, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Funding for Building New York was provided by First American Title Insurance Company of New York.